Hello my friends and welcome back to our channel Home is Where Our Heart Is. My name is Dane, author of the series of books Knowledge to Forage. I hope you're having a beautiful day. Today I thought we could take a stroll through the countryside and take a dive into foraging history. You see human beings have been foraging for wild food and medicine for just as long as we've existed. Only a few generations ago our grandparents relied on the knowledge to forage to survive. There is no greater example than this than in World War II, the largest conflict the world had ever seen. So if you're interested then come with me and we'll take a stroll through the countryside and dive into the World War foraging history. So let's use the power of imagination for a moment and turn back time. The year is 1938 and the UK for example at this point in history imports a staggering 70% of its food. Fruits, coffees, teas, Vitamin C rich oranges are all shipped in on big boats from abroad. But although lovely and luxury and of course delicious, this means that the UK isn't food self-sufficient and should anything get in the way of these big boat shipments, then we'd be in big trouble. The fateful hour of 11 has struck and Britain's final warning to Hitler having been ignored, a state of war once more exists between Great Britain and Germany. Boom! It's 1939 and World War II erupts, the largest war in human history. And all these big boats full of beautiful food find themselves sinking to the bottom of the ocean. Why? Because Adolf Hitler made sure of that. It was the merchantmen who were the U-boat's main target. In the North Atlantic and home waters, 3,663 Allied and neutral merchant ships were lost to enemy action in the war. More than 15.5 million tons of shipping. These big ships of food that we relied upon so much were now being intentionally targeted by the Nazis. The ocean was covered in planes, giant warships and sea mines, all with the orders to blow up our precious imported food. The war drove our country, as well as many others, into a state of emergency. We just didn't have enough food. This is when the rationing system came into place. And it didn't matter if you was rich or poor, the rationing applied to you. People had to queue outside shops for hours just to get some food. With everything being rationed, the people were left hungry. If you wanted more to eat, well, you'd have to grow it or find it yourself. So what did people do? Well, in the UK, the government started the Dig for Victory campaign. This was when every single available plot of land was turned into an allotment. It didn't matter if it was the local park or the Queen's front garden, it was used to grow food. And people also had to learn the skill of foraging. Because many of the men were off fighting a war, this was mainly left to the elderly, women and children. This multi-generational gang became fantastic at gardening and foraging. And by learning how to forage, they was able to add essential nutrition to their diets, as well as find fun flavors and even medicines. So how did the people become such skilled foragers? Well, it all started with this leaflet, the Hedgerow Harvest. This leaflet was posted out to the entire population of the UK in 1939. And within, it contains the basic knowledge to forage, such as illustrations, times to pick things, preservation techniques, as well as many recipes. Now the Hedgerow Harvest leaflet was great, but it was very basic and only full of drawn illustrations. So this was a helpful starter for the people to learn how to forage, but they would have also had to attend foraging courses too. Of course, they would have joined their local foraging group and head out into the countryside to expand their knowledge to forage. They would have head out into the fresh air with their local community to be guided by their local foraging experts. Here the experts would have explained to them the world of wild food, which is very, very simple. Firstly, if in doubt, leave it out. If you don't know what it is, don't eat it. And then secondly, the world of wild food flows with the seasons, spring, summer, autumn and winter. Here we'll go through our book, Knowledge to Forage, the foraging year to explain. You see, the year begins with spring, when the earth begins to burst with nutritious, fresh, new, healthy growth. Greens such as stinging nettles, cleavers, chickweed, mallow, beech leaves, hawthorn, dandelion and burdock, daisy, dock, wild garlic, flower blossoms and more all grow in abundance. 
Then we have the summertime, a time when the plants, trees and flowers begin to thrive in the warmth and sunshine. Plants and mushrooms such as borage, chamomile, chicken of the woods, roses, elderflowers, pine pollen, dead nettles, sweet violets, lemon balm, garlic mustard, grey oysters and many more grace our plates. Then as the weather begins to cool we flow into the autumn time. The autumn is a time of abundance when it comes to wild food. Apples, pears, plums, blackberries, raspberries, elderberries, beech nuts, walnuts, penny buns, shaggy ink caps as well as big plump roots from plants such as burdock and thistle. Then we have the tougher, colder days of winter. After a long year of producing flowers, fruits, nuts and roots, nature needs a rest. But there's still plenty of wild food to be found if you just know where to look for it. Pine needles and rose hips are rich in vitamin C. Gorse flowers make a fantastic bright yellow tea. Scarlet elf cups and jelly ears are nice to eat as well as all those plain green leafy greens such as chickweed, clover leaves, daisy leaves, three-cornered leek, wild garlic and more. Foraging was vital for the health of the nation. Rose hips, for example, rich in vitamin C, were used to make rose hip syrup. 500 tonnes was collected one year, all to create rose hip syrup. This was then rationed out to the nation. One teaspoon a day would keep you rich in vitamin C and keep the scurvy away. So many things that we'd become reliant upon being shipped in from abroad could now be replaced with wild food. Teas became replaced by herbal teas and even coffee was replaced by alternatives such as beech nut coffee or dandelion root coffee. Nettles replaced spinach, leaves and roots were used to bulk up soups and stews, apples preserved in chutneys, fruits squished into jams, even acorns and sweet chestnuts were used to replace flour. It wasn't just the wild food that saved our bacon, it was also the wild medicine too. Stinger nettles, for example, were used to make anti-asthma drugs, foxglove flowers gave us heart medicine, and the deadly nightshade was used to make eye medicine. Nature truly can provide for all our needs if we just know where to look. Finally, in 1945, World War II came to an end. But it was after this, once again, our knowledge to forage began to fade. Growing food and foraging was discontinued in schools and now the UK imports a staggering 80% of its food from abroad. So there we have it, people, the history of World War foraging. What an incredible history we all share. The countryside truly provides so many gifts while food medicine, wildlife, as well as great well-being. It heals your mental health just being out here amongst the birds, bees and the trees. As always people, don't forget to do all the modern world things such as like this video, comment, subscribe, share it so our nature inspired education can reach further across the land and of course if you want to own all the knowledge just like this video in two big book forms, check out our awesome book Knowledge to Forage and Knowledge to Forage the Foraging Year. But most importantly of all take care of yourselves and I'll see you all next time peace there wasn't any shooting but this ordinary shopping street has been the scene of a revolution a social revolution caused by the war which has changed the buying habits and therefore the living habits of the British people as drastically as bombs changed their towns pre-war Great Britain imported two-thirds of the food it ate and it ate pretty well. Mrs. Bill Green, an average British housewife, filled her market basket with her choice of foods brought from all over the world. She bought as much as she wanted of anything she could afford. But on that old system, the British could never have survived the war. Do you like standing in a queue for your vegetables? Or do you think it's tiring and a waste of valuable time? Do you ever find your long wait has been useless, that supplies of what you want have run out before your turn comes? It's not the greengrocer's fault, it's up to you. Dig for victory. Thousands of people have discovered that a ten-rod plot will keep a family of five in vegetables eight months of the year. Young men are doing it. These London AFS men are filling in their waiting periods like this young women. These girls are using part of their lunch hour to work on plots in their own factory grounds. Old men, even at 83, and 
children. Growing food is part of their school routine nowadays. But the finest tools a gardener can possibly use are his own two hands. Take a few tips like these from the old gardeners and you'll soon be growing your own tomatoes, peas that melt in the mouth, carrots that will be a revelation, potatoes at your service whenever you want them, and cabbages fit for a king. There's a bit of ground waiting for you somewhere. And surely, isn't an hour in the garden better than an hour in the queue?